Today's guest is Dr. Ross McKittrick. He's a professor of economics at the University of Guelph, where he specializes in environment, energy, and climate policy. Professor McKittrick has published widely for over two decades and is cited in Canada and around the world as an expert on global warming and environmental policy issues. He has been interviewed by Time, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, CBC, BBC, many other outlets, and has testified before the U.S. Congress and committees of the Canadian House of Commons and Senate. Let's just start on the the most general notes um, on this particular subject, the subject of climate change. Uh, What invited your interest to the degree that you have been interested? Well, uh, let's see, I have to go back a ways. When I was a graduate student in economics, I was sort of interested in environmental policy issues, the late 1980s. What interested me was there must be some important economic policy issues there, and there seemed to be a bit of a a separation between everybody knows if you're going to talk about monetary policy or tax policy you use economic analysis but then if we're going to talk about environmental policy for some reason people thought well you just make it up on the fly and and shield it from any discussion of costs and benefits and things like that and uh, so I was kind of curious about what economics had to say so when I was a grad student I studied some of the uh, writings by economists on environmental and resource policy issues. And then I got interested in a particular type of policy analysis and I needed a topic to apply it to. And this was the early 1990s. And there was some very early discussion about carbon taxes, but no one was really working on it. So I picked that topic and I, I did my PhD dissertation on modeling the effects of carbon taxes on the economy. Um, At some point, I also got inklings that there's more to it than uh, what I was being told. And I remember, for instance, at one conference, somebody went through the usual material and then they mentioned, well, there's this also this data set that comes from weather satellites. And the puzzling thing is it doesn't show any warming going on. And it showed a graph of it. And I was really floored by that because I thought, this is kind of an important discrepancy here. You've got... uh, uh, lots of known problems with the surface record, and here's a, another record that's, in some ways, it's better measured, and it's measuring right in the area of the atmosphere where you're expecting more of the warming, and it's not showing what you expect it to show. So not that I'm going to be in a position to figure out why the discrepancy, but why haven't I been told this after all the times that I've heard the conventional presentations? So I just began to read more and more on my own of the data part of it, the physical science part of it, trying to get a better sense of what are the difficulties and the uncertainties, began asking questions and talking to people, and then it all kind of snowballed after that. And a recurring theme for me has been because in my economics training, I had a lot of courses in econometrics and statistics and data analysis, which is uh, everyday bread and butter work for economists. And... uh, I realized, well, I could actually look at these data sets myself and do some of the analysis myself. And um, when I did that and began working with some other people who had similar interests, we would often just find the results aren't nearly as robust and solid as we've been led to believe. And there are a lot of of weaknesses that need to be discussed and and uncertainties that need to be discussed. And, And that's just been kind of a recurring theme in a lot of the work that I've done over the years. So what, what you said already <coughs> tells me something else, that you have been closer to it in the sense that you, you've made real study, is that at, at some moment uh, what's described and takes advantage of the standard or the status of the word described as science has inextricably uh, become intermixed with vast other fields. The biggest one, I think, is... Uh, an ism, uh, which is a political term, uh, environmentalism and a view of the world and that, that co-opts or at least engages with the science to the degree that it performs a rhetorical function, but that if you challenge any of the uh, subordinate issues at all, uh, you become something of a heretic. Is there any science that genuinely believes in heretics? 
Um, well, I guess what you're getting at is, is something I've uh, dealt with over the years in teaching environmental economics that um, um, I think most students that approach the subject realize, okay, like any other area of public policy, you have to tally up the costs and the benefits and figure out what's the best way of doing things. And if you want to accomplish a certain goal, what's the least expensive way of getting there? But um, there's also a constituency within the environmental movement that uh, is very resistant to any kind of what we would think of as balanced thinking on this. That um, they would take the view that any human imposed change on the natural system uh, is deeply problematic, is a, a moral issue and has to be resisted. Uh, it verges close to anti-humanism in the sense that if it's a uh, as one illustration I use in class is if a volcano erupts and it rips half a mountain off and destroys forests for 20 miles around, everybody just looks in wonder and says, isn't nature amazing at its power and all the things it can do? But if it was a group of companies that ripped half a mountain off and destroyed forests for 20 miles around, people would be horrified and think that that is damage, it's, we should never have done something like that. So if it's nature doing something that's okay. If it's humans doing something, that's problematic. And where that qualitative distinction comes from, I, I don't see the reflection on that that there should be. I mean, why is the action bad just because it's done by humans? Um, I guess another way of looking at it, and I encountered this in the uh, writings of an environmental philosopher I studied years ago, who was trying to get at the same question. Why is there a philosophical distinction between the actions of humans and the actions of nature. Um, because a lot of people who hold to that also hold to a strictly evolutionary viewpoint. And so if humans are just a part of nature, then everything humans do is part of nature. So you have no basis for even being an environmentalist if you start from that premise, because there's, there's nothing but the environment and there's nothing but nature. And um, now having said all that, I, uh, that's about the extent of my thinking on the subject. I, I find it curious that there's a heavy moral overtone in uh, environmental issues and climate issues. I try to just focus on things that are measurable and yeah. testable yeah. and um, uh, if there's a constituency out there that is not interested in that discussion then I wish them well but I don't really interact with them. Oh, let's go back again. It's, it's in the same territory. If, if we use science, and science is always the great lever in, the, in this particular discussion, this is the science, the science is say You're familiar with all the phrases, we'll go over them. But in any, any clear idea of science whatsoever, divorce from all politics, all science wants to know, and all science tries to achieve, that this is the case. Uh, it's not done for secondary, ulterior, ancillary motivations. There's no interest in finding the particular fact or set of facts. It is either this or it is not this. But my amateur reading of this one is that if you're not looking in a certain direction and in that direction only, and even if you have qualifications and you dissent or uh, depart from strict line thinking on the, the great, um, the extravagance of the disasters that are about to follow us, you're not a good human being in any of the traditional uh, sciences, and I will include there the social sciences, uh, accuracy, precision, um, some subordination to objectivity, regardless of your personal motivation and everything else. This is the kind of governing umbrella of all inquiry. But inquiry in this thing, as I have observed it, if it, if it ventures from certain territories, or if you ask to apply even standard tests, if such tests are possible, over so vast a territory, you get a lot of backlash. Uh, I found it in doing scribbles. The two topics that would get you the most animosity were Israel and the, te and the weather. And I often found that strange. Israel I can understand, but I'm not allowed to argue about the thermometer. The canons of science have been well established since the Royal Society days. We know what they are. They're clean, they're objective. They pursue no other interest but the interest of the fact itself. As an outsider to that kind of thing, I don't understand why the science of climate change is so driven by energies that are not scientific. Almost 20 years ago, uh, I co-authored a book with Christopher Essex at 
University of Western Ontario taken by storm. Yes, uh, there it is. We spent a lot of time talking about that issue. The, the puzzle at the heart of what we were trying to understand was that when you really get into the climate change issue, you're up against the most difficult problems in science. You're up against the turbulence problem, you're up against nonlinear systems, trying to tie together extremely difficult problems in atmospheric chemistry and physics and geology and paleoclimatology, the yeah. hardest fields that you can imagine, and yet the public presentation of it has been for decades now. It's settled and it's simple. Monolithic. Yeah, the science is settled. There's no uncertainty left. And we're in a position now to act and make ambitious decisions. Like I could understand if somebody took um, a moderately difficult topic and overstated the certainties, but like, there are branches of medical science that are fairly settled. Yeah. You know, you get an infection, there's one of several antibiotics. But even there, if you go into it, that you'll soon discover there are lots of unanswered questions and complexities, and nobody seems to um, expect otherwise. But on the climate topic, which in some ways is even more shrouded in unknowable, uncertain mysteries, the message is don't ask questions. It's settled, it's simple, and any, any minor remaining details don't matter at this point. We're, we, we know enough to act. And it's been like that for decades. The, uh, the phrase we came up with to describe that was the convection of certainty. Yes, I saw. That uh, you have groups interacting with each other and somehow they goad each other into ramping up statements of certainty. And, and in particular on this, the political side, you've got a, um, a long-standing political agenda where for various reasons, most of them I think unrelated to the climate issue itself, they'd like to pursue an agenda. And in order to motivate that agenda, they need to be able to say, the science requires us to do this. I mean, yeah. It's always a very comfortable position for a politician to be in, to say, I know this is gonna hurt, but the science requires it's us to do it. Well. That political constituency, it, it requires this constant meal of certainty. And it will go out to the scientific community and say, we need this message of certainty, and, and there are structures now in place that deliver it. We just saw an example of that in Canada not long ago when Environment Canada put out a report, yeah. that, um, <clears throat> the state of the climate, or whatever yes. it's called, which is a very informative report. It's, um, it's mu I think, much better done than the U.S. counterpart. Um, for the most part, it's just empirical, summarizing changes since 1948. A lot of it, I think, they left out things that should have been in there, but almost within 24 hours, the politicians who find that material useful were already misrepresenting the contents and were overstating certain aspects of it. Um, things like the, the flooding that's going on now in Ontario and Quebec. Um, you can't find in that report any indication that that's attributable to greenhouse gases or that um, there's even a trend towards more extreme precipitation events. Um, that's just not in the records that they have. And yet, that report is used and, and misused uh, to allow politicians to say, well, we're certain of the problem, our solution is X, and you're just gonna have to believe it and not question it. Just on that, on that one subset of that point alone, how is it that Anybody in the space of 24 hours, and if we're speaking again of rationality and science, can link a specific and highly localized phenomenon. Let's say it's a wildfire, it's a flood, or it's one hot day somewhere in Twillingate, and that within a, within 24 hours it could be a minister of the government saying, "We know," and we, and by the way, they are saying it. Mm -hmm. We know that this is caused by climate change, so X and Y must happen. Yeah. It, there's simply not enough time <clears throat> to wield the analysis to link it, even if it were true. I mean, I, 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 I um, cannot understand this. Yeah, it's opportunistic. Uh, it's ambulance chasing. Um, here's one puzzle about that, that um, if there's a bad storm, a tornado that hit Ottawa last year, suddenly people rush in and say, we're going to connect this to climate change. Climate change is the cause of the tornado that happened that day. 
What they'll never do though is if there was a week of beautiful mild weather before that, they aren't going to say, actually we would have had tornadoes all last week as well, but because of climate change we had beautiful mild weather. The ordinary enjoyable weather is not an event that needs to be explained. There's an assumption that it's only bad weather that needs to be explained and climate change only causes bad weather. Climate change never causes good weather. So we were going to get the good weather anyway. When, when you start to unpack it like that, you realize they're making the whole thing up. There is absolutely no is scientific it. basis for any of those attribution claims. They are, uh, it's opportunistic and it's made up. Well, you reminded me of another point. I know other people have, have raised this, so it's not original to me, but it's really very interesting. You just mentioned the weather and therefore if it's bad weather, it always goes to that particular cause. If you go and you can easily find it on, on online anywhere you want to look, if you want a, a list of all the negative things that have been uh, extraordinarily assigned, mm -hmm. everything from warts to the color of a rabbit's tail, there is nothing negative that is changing that is not explained by climate science. And this is the bigger point. If you go to positive things, it's an empty sheet. Mm -hmm. How can one vast phenomenon be so one-dimensionally negative? Sometimes I think as you hear some of these extraordinary attributions, um, if you just mentally substitute the word devilry for climate change, <laughs> it comes across the same way that um, it's devilry at work. And well, at that point, there's no way to argue the point um, decisively. And yeah, I've seen those kinds of lists and you're right. The, and you look at the articles underneath and they're so full of, well, coulds and maybes and mights and probabilities and um, and I think it's embarrassing I hope it's embarrassing for the people that work in climate analysis to to have that stuff around their neck. Well that's that's the strange point and that's one of the reasons why it's, it's very interesting to talk to you and uh, I'd like to speak about this as well. I'm guessing because I'm not in universities I'm guessing that some of the very solid minds and some of them are very solid and very well put together who look at this and who know both from experience and from their own intelligence, that this thing is getting vastly out overweighed uh, by motions that are, in one sense, crowd psychology, uh, that business of confirmation bias, mm -hmm. and international and national influences from various small p political movements. And yet in the universities where I would expect conscience to be a play of serious, where are the people with the equipment, and they actually do know, you're the exception, they know that this is not just twisting the data, this is something, this is a phenomenon other than science in many of its operations. What's, why are the universities slow to pick this up? It's hurting them in their science departments. I think in the early days of this issue, there was a, a sense of the people working in just the, the mainstream areas of climate, a lot of them just do their work on small topics and they don't aspire to play in any larger field than that, but the ones that had a bit of profile, they wanted this to be on the public agenda, they wanted it to be a, um, attract attention and people to be concerned about it, so they were willing to tolerate a bit of exaggeration and, and uh, um, dressing up the issue. Um, and they may not have realized, or they may be coming to realize, that that process has now moved beyond them and so now you've got situations, for instance, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think at various points in its history, it's exaggerated certain things, it's downplayed uncertainties that it should have been more honest about. It's, um, it, it was uh, goosing the story along. Now that whole constituency that wants certainty and wants catastrophe and wants uh, the big scary message, um, it's beginning to detach itself from the IPCC because the um, the message in the IPCC reports just isn't keeping up with where the exaggeration folks want to yeah. go. And this is where you're going to see what you're describing. That This is the point where the people in the universities and the people uh, in the, the main branch of the science are going to have to decide what's their um, pain threshold for when they finally speak up about the gross exaggerations on this. Uh, one example was um, when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez began saying that we have 12 years 
you know, essentially, if we don't solve this in 12 years, there won't be a planet to live on, and what's the point of worrying about anything else? A few people in the climate modeling field very tepidly stepped up to say that's not actually correct, and uh, we don't want to be misconstrued here, but that's probably overstating it a bit. I would have liked it if they would just stand up and... Say it's ridiculous. Yeah, just properly smack her down and say, well, where did you get that nonsense from? It's a start that they're willing to uh, back away a little bit from that extremism. However, it's also too little and too late at this point. The, well, the machinery is rolling far beyond where they yeah, can control that's, that's, now. that's actually the bigger question I want to get to. I, I'll come back to that because there are some local things too. Of all the issues that we contend with in our own country, um, most of them are within our own borders, etc. And we deal with that. I know there's external things that play into it as well. But there is no issue like climate change, which is the environment, which is, which is by definition everything, pure mm -hmm. and simple. And it is therefore global. It is therefore planetary. And therefore calls uh, into existence policies Vaster than any other that we can comprehend, even even in the terms of the great wars we've known. This is this is the entire planet. We pretend that those were world wars; they were something else. So you have an issue that will demand a response on such a vast scale mm -hmm. in countries that are not symmetrical in their development or economics that impose of necessity. It's an existential threat to the entire planet and the species. Necessarily, profoundly radical changes. And yet, in academics and in the media, you would think this issue, more than any other issue, would have furious scruple and investigation. But I'm speaking from my side of this coin. 99% of it is cheerleading for a so-called established consensus. How can this be? The picture that you paint, I think it, it describes the bind for most uh citizens and most ordinary politicians because you're presented with this this view of an extraordinary looming catastrophe uh, I'm again uh, yeah asteroid collision scale um, catastrophe and the remedy that's proposed is an asteroid collision scale catastrophe for the economy which one would you like would you like this catastrophe or that catastrophe and um, why it's controversial on, on, on the climate side to say this might not be a catastrophe. You know, we actually have good reason to think this is going to be a small issue that we can deal with. Um, even within the IPCC report, this is uh, one of the best quotes in the last IPCC report that um, people have no idea it's in there because it's kind of buried towards the back, but it, they say, over the 21st century, the effects of climate change will be small in comparison with changes in the economy and technology and society and all the yes. other things that people are going to deal with. You don't get that message uh, from the cheerleaders uh, that you describe. The, the message is only this is a, an imminent catastrophe. Now, it's been imminent for about 30 years, so it's a bit slow to show up as an imminent catastrophe. But um, I think... The, uh, the cheerleaders, perhaps they're trying to ramp that side up because they know that the policy agenda, when you really understand it, that is, um, uh, with the technology we have today, that would be an economic catastrophe. If you tried to get global carbon dioxide emissions down 80% yeah, from where they are in today, 10 years. you are talking about reducing energy use by roughly 80%. And um, the carbon dioxide issue is, is different that way because it's so tied to fossil fuel use. It's not, it, it's not the same as other air pollutants that we can yeah. disconnect from fossil fuel use. We can't disconnect CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use. So if you're going to try to achieve this radical reduction in CO2, first of all, it, it doesn't actually have all that much in the way of effect for 50 to 100 years out. But also, it would, it would mean the end of economic growth and the end of the development process in, in, in poor the countries. World, in parts of the world that need the development process. Yes. And so it would be a catastrophe. And even in a country like Canada, where we've seen the government monkey around with the electricity system in Ontario yeah. and 
oops, we accidentally tripled your electricity prices. And, and put some 40,000 households out of power for a while. Yeah, and, um, and in the end, the effect of all of that is, is unmeasurably small in the global climate. With this picture of catastrophe versus catastrophe, I think one of the binds that uh, the whole climate science field is in now is they're like the banks in 2008. They're too big to fail. It doesn't matter how uh, crummy the balance sheet gets. Um, there's so much now riding on it that they can't do any course correction. And now we know that that didn't work out for the banks very well. And I think there's going to be some reckonings for, especially for the climate modeling industry, where um, they've got some big failures to deal with. And that wouldn't be a problem if people understood that models of any kind, including climate models, are really study tools. They're, they're ways of trying to figure out the system, because the system is too complicated to figure out, so you build a simplified climate model of it, and you try to figure out how that works and hope that you learn something. But when it's set up as this is a forecasting tool that we can make precise calculations with and base policy decisions on, then we're entitled to ask, well, how good a forecasting yeah. tool is this? And, and they don't work very well for that. That's, that's the other point in this dimension I want to get to. I can't think of any other discipline or semi-discipline, if I can use that term, that has got so many things wrong. They, they come out with such vivid language about this will happen or we got two years or we got 48 hours. I remember Gordon Brown saying he had 72 days or something. And yet, and the models project this, or they 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 failed, or discrepancies are vast. How can anything that pretends to be a settled science have so many failures of prediction, and has has nothing, as far as I can tell, by which it will test alternate hypotheses? Well, I, I mentioned that I did my PhD on modeling carbon taxes, and I used a a type of tool called computable general equilibrium modeling, and. They're very interesting systems to set up. You have to think through all the pieces of how an economy might work and all the parts interact and affect each other. And then you do your policy experiment and it says, well, this industry is going to be affected this much. And you, the numbers all come out. The computer just spits them out. And I remember at the end of it asking myself, what have I done? Like, what, what does any of this mean? Are these forecasts? Would I invest on the basis of these numbers, and I'm not sure I even believe the forecasts. And also, if the numbers come out and they look really crazy, then you go back and you change the model to make sure that the numbers look vaguely plausible when they come out. So you have to go back to this uh, modeling is a tool for understanding. You can't work on the real world. It's too complicated. So you build a model of it and you try to understand your model and hope that in the end you've learned something that gives you some insight about the real world. And, and the people who do economic modeling, uh, they understand this. And economists tend to be very skeptical of their own models. And um, I, I'm pretty sure no economist who does that type of computable general equilibrium modeling would ever invest money based on the outputs of those models. But we do use them to try to understand what might happen as a result of a policy change. And the climate profession gets the, they, they're entitled to be cut the same slack. If they use their models as learning tools and as tools to try to understand, okay, how would an El Nino affect the rainfall near the Sahara Desert? Well, we'll use a model for that. But when they get to the point of saying, um, either we're going to predict and tell you what the weather's going to be like in 10 years. 80 or, years. 80 years or 300 years, um, or if they're going to go and say whenever there's uh, a hurricane, to then go say, well, that was, we predicted that. That's climate change too. Yeah, we, that's consistent with our models. And then they get into this game of always saying, yes, that's consistent with our predictions, but only after the fact. They never uh, tell you ahead of time what their prediction are, but when something's happened, then they'll say, oh yeah, we predicted that. Um, then I think, no, you're misusing your models. You're, you're not using those tools properly. And, uh, and at that point, we're entitled to be very critical of that. Well, also, it's an abandonment of the discipline. Here's one other question just on the methodology. Why is it that this particular, I won't call it a science, I think it's an amalgamation of emergent sciences 
all bundled together, as you were saying earlier, from paleontology to atmospheric dynamics. And now there's this vast collection of various disciplines of various uh, levels of development that pretending to be a unitary thing, pronouncing judgment on a single item. But one of the great drives of science is if I get a good theory, I try to figure out ways that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. How many times or how often does the climate industry put itself to the rigorous task of say, let's see if we can disprove our own point of view, which is what we should try to do in these things. At, at one level, they look to try to refute their own theories, but there's also a bit of a slogan in science that um, it takes a, a theory to replace a theory, that, yeah. um, uh, that people are reluctant if you get a data set and it conflicts with a theory just to throw the theory out on the spot. Usually what you say is, okay, I'm going to put that on the shelf for now and, and see if I can come up down the road with another idea yeah. that works better. So. Um, they, there is that kind of testing, but when you get up to a very large level, and this is the level of what are called general circulation models, just the, the big overarching framework, um, those models, I would say, um, it gets back to this, they're too big to fail. They're insulated from testing in the sense that no matter how badly they do at describing the evolution of the actual climate, um, it's going to be very difficult for anyone in the field just to say, you know what, I think there's something fundamentally wrong with the models. Um, I think if it went on for decades that they just kept predicting something that isn't happening, then yeah, eventually you'd see that, but um, it's not gonna happen just with a, a decade worth of And, and in the meantime, to bring up the name, you know, use Cortez as, as a kind of stand-in for all the other politicians in the same way, some politicians realize the emotive power, the rhetoric of climate change is a very great driver of votes if, if you're on the right side. And they're going to enact policies based on the salesmanship that they, then the politicians, using the thing. In other words, well, we have it here in Canada. I've questioned out loud many times why it is that in all of the energy developments all over this world, that it, and I don't think we're being parochial here, that it's the Alberta energy field that somehow or other has become associated to an extreme degree with the survival of the planet. In proportion, it makes no sense. But, but nonetheless, illogic and politics streams through this thing, and yet is, is under the great banner of those. these are one of the subjects that serious people, I'm certainly not that, don't question. Mm -hmm. And it's the failure of questioning that I think is, is most derelict both from the media, from science itself, and from the universities as, as institutions that are in the business of making sure that knowledge is actually knowledge and not some farcical mixture of all sorts of things. Is it a religion? At least within politics, however disordered the rhetoric gets, there are certain guardrails in terms of what actually happens. And to the great frustration of some of the activists on the climate issue, they can commission polls and get these very encouraging results that yeah. most people believe in the issue, they're concerned about it, they want government to do something. And then when the policies get implemented, then they realize, yeah, the, the public wants you to do something as long as it doesn't cost anything. And when it's actually going to cost more than $1.30 a day or, or whatever the, the threat is, then the interest evaporates and, and people aren't willing to uh, embrace the radical agenda, which is why in the U.S. Senate, when uh, the Republicans mischievously put the Green New Deal up for a vote, uh, not a single Democrat senator voted for it because they know that they, that would be a millstone around their neck in the next election if they did. So um, you can have the U.S. Democratic Party or any number of parties in other countries who will happily stand up and make a speech about the imperative of tackling climate change and we, we need to deal with it right away. Or eight years of Obama on this, of yeah. speech after speech. And, uh, um, and yet when you look at what they're actually willing to implement, they can read the tea leaves there as well as everyone. But um, the public appetite for policy on this is, is, is very small in comparison to every other issue that's, yeah. that's on the public agenda. I'll just just try this one more time. That 
this other aspect, of it, at least as I see it, you can debate various things in, in our politics, both here in the States and Europe, uh, but within even, not even, but particularly in journalistic circles. Uh, the normal edge of inquiry and inquisition that is part of journalism, just a much different way as science, is doubt, skepticism. Those are the beginning feints of any approach to a big subject. This is how you clear your mind. Uh, on this, well, you know that awful term denier. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone with a sense of uh, semantics knows that that's, that's vulgar to the point of blasphemy of what they're suggesting. Uh, and yet you get you get normal newspapers, normal television stations, identifying people as deniers, which is a participation in the, in the message rather than a reporting of it. Why is this subject so so free of the normal tests and inquiries that belong to any other big subject? I've been asking that for a long time, and I'm not sure I really have the answer to it. Um, on an issue like denier. Um, well, to be a denier is the same as being an affirmer. I mean, you deny one thing because you affirm something else. So um, everybody is equal parts denier and affirmer. So for instance, I think that climate models systematically exaggerate certain aspects of the way the climate works because I've done the analysis and published the results and shown that that's the case. And so if somebody then would thinks I'm a denier because I think climate models exaggerate the warming response in the tropical troposphere, I guess I have to accept that as just a, a valid well, label, right. but it means that I affirm the results of my own analysis. And, but but as, you, as you are well aware, the, the purpose of that particular term is to have a very cheap association with an historical crime of vast proportions. And that, that brings up another thing. I, I, this is amateur again. Their willingness to use not only cheap, but uh, very immoral tactics. People who do take strong stands on this out of rational reasoning and no other interest, who say, you know, we may be turning a corner too fast and it may do harm, so I want to be on board, or, you know, the, the, the Norwegian guy. Uh, yet, if you divert, dissent from this, you'll have, in the case of Mr. Suzuki, at one time going into school saying you should put these people in jail at some point, mm -hmm. and you'll have some ferocious articles uh, from the deep true believers. I don't know how you accommodate the moral purpose of saving the planet with oh, these very smeary, immoral tactics that are as cheap as any political campaign. Yeah, it, it is a moralistic issue. And um, because of that, it means uh, certain categories of rhetoric get a, a free pass. There's a halo around it. And the practitioners of that rhetoric, they realize, well, we just said something that was even more inflammatory and it, we weren't criticized for it. And said, Let's have another go. <laughs> yeah, so let's ramp it up. And uh, um, there's no consequences on that side and um, no negative ramifications. Another aspect to it uh, reminded me while you were talking is um, there's a notion among some academics that um, regardless of what the studies say, regardless of what the data say, if um, we'll keep a lid on some of it because, and the phrase would be, we don't want to give fodder to skeptics. Yeah. We don't want to say anything, even if it's true, if those skeptics out there might write op-eds or call attention to it, um, so we're better off keeping a lid on that. And that goes a long way back. The Climate Gate emails showed that um, that goes back into the 1990s. In the preparation of one of the earlier IPCC reports, when they were confronted with data. They wanted to show a graph of a hockey stick data, and some, but some of the paleoclimate reconstructions disagreed with it completely. And they're concerned, well, if we show all the data, yeah. we're just giving fodder to skeptics. And so they truncated the data. They, they, they simply chopped part of it off for the purpose of making the graph in order to, well, hide the decline in that case and, and conceal the discrepancy in the data sets. But this notion uh, this is a very dangerous notion for the scientists to be tailoring what they're going to show people so that they don't furnish an argument for the other side because they're, they're assuming that, um, well, maybe that argument is actually legitimate. Maybe yes. this so-called fodder for skeptics, this is someone's going to make a legitimate argument about a policy issue or about uh, an issue in 
computational modeling, but it might be a correct argument. And this might be the, a key piece of information that's going to actually help people come to the right conclusion. But if you're going to censor all that um, at the, uh, the report writing stage, then, well, you're into dangerous territory there. Yeah, you meant, I'm glad you mentioned it. I think I'll wrap her up or get close to wrapping up around this. For some people that will be watching this probably know of it already, but others will not. Give me a, a compressed account of the hockey stick, because that's probably, mm -hmm. A, the most famous branding gesture that's ever been received. And outside of Climate Gate itself, I think it's probably the most stringent challenge that the whole philosophy of global warming uh, had to face. Just tell me about the, the climate, the hockey stick, rather. Mm -hmm. um. The, the picture that had been in, in people's mind, in scientists' mind about climate change for a long time was that there are some identifiable cycles that there was a very warm period in the Roman era and then dark ages were cold and then the medieval period was very warm, the age of cathedral building and, and the expansion of agriculture and then there was a long interval called the Little Ice Age which um, involved steady cooling and expansion of glaciers up until the 1800s and then we're in a warm phase after that. So that picture of hills and valleys um, was there even in the first IPCC report. And then in the late 1990s, um, uh, an American scientist, Michael Mann, and his co-authors published a very different picture. They said based on tree ring analysis that at least for the past thousand years um, is really just a straight cooling line and then you get to the 20th century and the temperature begins to soar very rapidly and we're rising up the blade of the stick and um, they made a lot of claims about the statistical rigor of their methods and that this is much more credible and persuasive than anything any, that had gone any, before any yeah. <clears throat> and governments latched onto this this sort of goes to the point about governments wanting this yeah. this blood meal of certainty on a regular basis that they they splashed the hockey stick everywhere. It was in government reports, it was on websites, it was uh, quoted all over the place, and, and the IPCC made it the, the headline in their, uh, their next report. And, um, and yet it was very hard to tell how this graph was put together, what the methods were, what the data was. And at a professional level, um, a few people took a bit of a look at it, but nobody really tried to understand it until this um, uh, curious Toronto mining executive, Steve McIntyre, um, he decided it was, a, he said it was slow time at work and he was used to unpacking mining promotion graphs and this looked to him like a promotional graph. And he, he was interested in how it was put together so he just started trying to get the data and he emailed the author and lo and behold the author didn't know where all the data was and, and he'd have to ask an assistant to try to put it together and, and Steve just thought this is amazing this graph that's been so heavily used by governments around the world and obviously no one's ever asked to see the data because the author didn't know off the top of his head where the data was and um, so Steve began he finally got a copy of the uh, what was alleged to be the data set and then he began going to the underlying sources and trying to reconstruct the, the data set from scratch and this was around 2003 and he emailed me because he'd seen me on yeah. TV talking about Kyoto and knew I was an economist in Guelph and said can I show you my notes so we met and I th realized that he'd done what nobody else had done, which was just try to replicate this thing from original sources. Yeah. And he was finding all kinds of discrepancies and problems. So I agreed to work with him. We wrote a bunch of papers. Um, the, right from the beginning when we began to publish analysis challenging the construction of this hockey stick and showing that it really wasn't robust, that you could get all kinds of different shapes with the same data set based on minor variations in processing. That was one of our first messages. But then we also identified some specific technical errors in the statistical analysis. And really our conclusion was um, they can't conclude anything about how our current era compares to the medieval period. The, their data and their methods just aren't precise enough and they're overstating the, the, the certainty of their analysis. It led to, um, well, all kinds of things. Uh, hearings in the US before Congress, the uh, appointment of a National Academy of Sciences panel to try to settle these disputes. Um, it led it to lawsuits that are going on the to this day. 
um, lots of academic articles. Um, one of the things I find kind of amusing is Steve and I published a number of academic articles on the subject, and yet, um, despite this huge debate going on, um, somehow our work was unsighted in the middle of all of this. And we, Steve heard through back channels, there was sort of an unstated agreement among people in the field not, not to cite our work, not to give us citations so that our citation count wouldn't go up. And uh, I kind of think if you're very influential, your article will get a lot of citations. Yeah. But if you're extremely influential, it'll get no citations you'll at get, all, and yet everybody You'll will, get disappeared. <laughs> nobody will, will, will cite it, but they'll all talk about it. Um, so uh, that, uh, the outcome of all of that was that particular graph, um, I would say with a high level of confidence, the, first of all, the statistical methods are just wrong. There are computational errors in it. And the uncertainties in that data set are extremely large. And the only reason it even looks the way it does is because the um, computational method ends up throwing out the information in most of the data set and just cherry picks this small number of tree ring records that happen to have a hockey stick shape. And those particular tree ring records, um, the authors that put them together in the first place, they're just from one particular region in the Yes, a very small region. number of trees. Yes. And the authors said, by the way, this profile looks nothing like what the temperature records in the region look like, so don't use these as temperature proxies. Ah. And um, that was one of the conclusions of the National Academy of Science panel as well. They said these proxies should not be used in, in temperature reconstructions, which hasn't stopped people in the paleoclimate field from using them over and over and over again. And, and astonishingly, they get the same <laughs> hockey stick shape, and then they say, well, this is independent confirmation of the hockey stick. Um, the, the methods were wrong, the data is unreliable for the purpose, and I would just say that, that graph is really uninformative about the uh, historical climate. Uh, apart from people who had the, the sense of scruple that you have, you get, a, you, you get yourself personally, I mean, you're a professor, you get, you get a lot of backlash from that, uh, from outside, uh, lots of condemnations for being one of those people trying to, you know, put the planet off its orbit because of your inquiries. <laughs> um, in the early years, I did. I think uh, um, it, during the hockey stick episode, there was a, a huge amount of backlash. That was, that was pretty negative. And um, but other th other things around then, um, uh, yeah, I would get uh, negative calumny, but um, also would get encouragement and, and a lot of secret handshakes from people, including from some unexpected quarters and. Um, I have the luxury, though, I'm in an economics department where most of my colleagues don't really care about the climate issue and they don't follow it very closely and they, they kind of get a kick out of it when I'm, I'm on TV. And um, yeah, so I can do things that I couldn't do if I was uh, trying to work in an actual climatology okay, department. I, I will wind it down on here. That's, that's the, it's in your book as well, various aspects of it. That because the funding of this issue, people talk about money from oil companies. If you talk about the funding from the multiple countries and the United Nations and the NGOs, and it, it exfoliates forever. That's gone into this for 20 or 30 years and within university departments that are dependent on government sources for grants. If you've decided the science and it's a settled science, you better be on the right side of the science. Judith mm -hmm. Curry has written a lot about this. Mm -hmm. How much are they, in, in a sense, building their own tunnel? and inducing the younger minds, the, the minds that are waiting to get in, that you better go this way if you want to go up any academic ladder, or for that matter, if you want to furnish your institution with any money. Yeah, that, uh, that's an important issue. I mean, that creates this uh, momentum. Um, I've sat on, on committees that review grant applications, and uh, it gets really depressing after a while because there are more and more of these uh, grant funding programs they've been around for a long time, they're extremely well funded and the government will fund research on climate science, but it's not just open-ended, um, do something interesting. It's always set up like uh, we're going to have a special fund to study climate impacts and we want you to tell us yeah. how climate change is going to destroy this particular species of field mouse or, or the impacts on the economy. And, and you're pretty much constrained, you have to come up 
with the answer they're looking for. You have to propose a study that's guaranteed to come up with the answer yeah. they're looking for. And, and even uh, the times that I've sat on these committees, if I, as a conscientious researcher, would like to steer some money just to the people who want to ask an open-ended question and see what the data show, um, people know this is how you get money. And um, the, the amounts at the government level are vast and, and limitless. And then another odd thing is anyone who wants to set up a climate change protest group, it seems like they have limitless amounts of money available to them. I mean, there are groups that appear out of nowhere, like this Greta Thunberg yeah. uh, person. Uh, that's a, a large organization that just instantly appeared um, to put her on the world stage and ferry her around. And, and uh, that kind of uh, group, obviously there's an enormous amount of money. And then the Extinction Rebellion group that are yeah, gluing themselves to Yeah, interesting name. Yeah. Um, out of nowhere, you've got a bunch of people. Now it's a, around the world and they, uh, you know, these things cost money to do all this. And uh, no matter how loony your idea is, if you're going to protest climate, the, the well, money will be there for you. The well, that's, yeah. I'll add comment to that. That's, that's where the, the press failing is, is truly abysmal. Uh, if if some some guy from uh, Texaco or whatever the hell it is these days walks out and says something, every journalist in the country gets the magnifying glass out. Uh -huh. You can you can announce yourself a protest activist uh, from anywhere, uh -huh. and you can make the most strident, ridiculous claims. The same scrutiny never gets applied. No one will ask about that young woman, uh, where she derives her authority, who helps her, assists her, or None of these organizations get scrutiny. The oil companies, of course, are the permanent villains of the earth uh, for keeping us warm and enabling our agriculture. The pro I don't know how it is that the press, which is so prideful of its contributions to public discussion and democracy, can actually live with itself in, in how it has been so negligent in the most, most basic skepticism about the biggest issue of our day. It's, it's, it's bad. It's hurting itself like science may be hurting itself. Anyway, I've worn you down enough. I thank you very much for agreeing to do this because it's a charity from your point of view. I wouldn't do it. Anyway, thanks for coming along. Thanks, Rex. My pleasure.